great to be back here at, at Kinport with all of you. Uh, I, I brought some of my books along, uh, Pursuing God's Best for Your Life. And uh, it's a fresh look at a topic that maybe we don't talk about a lot, sanctification. So uh, my wife would be back there at the close if you're interested in taking one or more copies with you. So how many of you are going to Africa? All right, I see some hands. My wife and I have been there twice. I've been there th uh, three times, maybe more than that. I'm trying to remember, but at least three times because I was there to climb Mount Kilimanjaro back in 2011. And then before that, we were in Namibia. What country are you going to? Tanzania. Tanzania. All right, I was in Tanzania. I'll tell you, if you've never been to Africa, uh, you'll come back. Your heart will have been stirred, and uh, God will use you in a, in a special way there. I know we, uh, we enjoyed every one of our mission trips to Africa. So praise God. I hope more of you will sign up and be a part of that. Well, we're going to talk this morning about a subject that the Holy Spirit uh, stirred in my heart uh, a few months back. As I was reading an article about uh, many of the things that are going on in our world that you would look at and you would say, what is happening in our world? And, uh, and I realized that in the midst of all the shaking that's going on in our world, uh, God wants to raise up his people to be a voice for him, to be ambassadors for Jesus and so I want to talk about how to live as an ambassador for Jesus in a broken world. And I want to just say that uh, your community needs ambassadors for Jesus. Your community needs ambassadors for Jesus. Your workplace needs ambassadors for Jesus. It does. Your school system needs ambassadors for Jesus. Your friends, your family, they need ambassadors for Jesus. We're living in a broken world that needs Jesus. So what, what should be our attitude in the midst of all that we see going on in the world around us, the brokenness and the heartache? I mean, we can become angry. Well, we can become bitter. We can become condemning. Uh, we can join those who are calling names and pointing fingers of blame. But church, those are the world's weapons. Those aren't our weapons as God's people. Those are the world's weapons. So in Hebrews chapter 12, uh, beginning at uh, verse uh, 26, we read uh, these words. At that time, his voice shook the earth, pointing back to what happened at Mount Sinai. But now he has promised, once more I will shake not only the earth but also the heavens the words, once more, indicate the removing of what can be shaken, that is, created things, so that what cannot be shaken may remain. And then hear what the writer writes here to us. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, so all the kingdoms of this earth can and will be shaken. And that's some of what you see going on today. But we are what? Receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. So the writer says, let us be thankful. Say that word with me. Thankful. Let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe. For our God is a consuming fire. We are... Um, we are living in an area that ha in an era that has great cultural similarities to the first century, and I would challenge you to sometime in the months to come read through the Book of Acts again, and see how the first century followers of Jesus lived in a hostile culture, because they were living in a hostile culture, and in many ways today. We're living in a hostile culture, but in the midst of that, God provides many opportunities. So I just want to encourage you that when you gather this Thursday for Thanksgiving, 
that you set aside political conversations and you talk about how to live for Jesus today. And you reflect on all he's done for you. Because how many of you want to take people to heaven with you? Amen? Amen? And wouldn't it be wonderful that by next Thanksgiving there were more names written in the book of life in heaven? Yep, because we were focused on our, our mission. So we're going to spend time today looking at things that the Apostle Peter wrote to the believers of his day because they were living in very difficult times. They were living in hostile times. Uh, they were living in a culture that was not friendly to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he wrote to them to encourage them to be a light for Christ, to be ambassadors for Christ in the midst of the darkness of their world. So I'm going to start in 1 Peter chapter 1 and read verses 3 to 6, and we're going to be looking at a lot of Scripture today. So whether you uh, have a Bible like this with you or whether you're using your handheld device, 1 Peter 1, 3 to 6, All praise to God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is by His great mercy that we have been born again, because God raised Jesus Christ from the dead. Now we live with great expectation. Say that with me. Great expectation. Notice, we don't live with great fear. And when you think about the situation they were living in and some of our situations today that can be fear-producing, Peter doesn't say we're living in a time of great fear. He says we're living with great expectation and we have a priceless inheritance, an inheritance that is kept in heaven for you, pure and undefiled, beyond the reach of change and decay. And through your faith, God is protecting you by his power until you receive this salvation, which is ready to be revealed on the last day for all to see so be truly glad there is wonderful joy ahead, even though you must endure many trials for a little while. That's the New Living Translation, by the way. Now, Peter doesn't start his letter talking about how bad things are, but rather about the wonderful blessings they had received in Jesus, blessings for which we should give praise and thanksgiving to God. Amen? And, and you know what, church? If Paul and Silas could sing in prison, then we can be worshipers of the living God no matter what's happening in our culture, right? And, and no matter who is in the House or the Senate or the White House or whatever, God is still on the throne, right? And, and we're worshiping and praising Him. So in the verses and chapters then that follow uh, Peter's introduction here, he calls them to live as ambassadors for Jesus in their broken world. So how do we do that? And that's the question I want to answer this morning, and we're just inviting the Holy Spirit to open our hearts to grow in our understanding and to become equipped to do this. So first of all, be an example of godliness for unbelievers. Be an example of godliness for unbelievers. 1 Peter 1, 13 to 15. So prepare your minds for action and exercise self-control. Put all your hope in the gracious salvation that will come to you when Jesus Christ is revealed to the world. So you must live as God's obedient children. Don't slip back into your old ways of living to satisfy your own desires. You didn't know any better then. But now you must be holy in everything you do, just as God who chose you is holy. For the scriptures say, you must be holy because I am holy. These verses teach us that we have a mission to fulfill. And if our minds are constantly on all the evil around us, we will be distracted. Have any of you found yourself in the last couple months distracted? Yeah, I, I mean, it happens to all of us at times where we get caught up in the evil of our world and we get distracted. I don't mean we get caught up in participating in it, but we get caught up and that's all we talk about. And we get distracted from our mission. 
So in the verses that follow, Jesus is our example of how to live in an unholy and hostile world. You will remember that some people listened to Jesus, but some people cursed him. In the same way, there will be people who will listen to you, and there will be some who will give you a hearing, and some who will curse you. So what should you do? Well, remember Jesus told us to pray for those who misuse us. He said that if we obey him in doing this, he said this in Matthew 5, 4, he said, you will show or you will prove yourselves to be children of your Father who is in heaven. So church, we have something to prove. Prove that we are children of God. We, we are called to even bless those who don't deserve it. You're probably familiar with uh, this person's name, Candace Cameron Bure, who uh, was formerly a Hallmark star. And uh, you probably have noticed that recently in the past week, uh, she's been in the news, but she's been in the news in a very negative way because she said that she won't use her movies to promote an agenda that undermines traditional marriage. And because she said that, she's being cursed, she's being bullied, there is hateful rhetoric being directed at her because she's taken a stand. And here's what she said in response to all of that. I am a devoted Christian, which means that I believe that every human being bears the image of God. Because of that, I'm called to love all people, and I do. In everything I do and say, God's love and God's compassion is front and center. All of that comes from the love that God himself showered upon humanity when he gave the gift of joy and forgiveness on that first Christmas morning 2,000 years ago. What a great answer to those who are cursing her, who are taking her name in vain, uh, who are directing hate toward her, She's responding with blessing toward them and pointing them toward Jesus Christ. I, I, I believe that is being a good ambassador for Jesus in our world today. You see, 1 Peter 3, 9 says, Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult, but with blessing, because to this you were called so that you may inherit a blessing. Now, when I read that verse... I don't know what you say to yourself, but I say to myself, I need help. And I need divine help to do that because I know sometimes we're angry about what's going on in our world. And sometimes it even comes home to our own families, right? That we're, we're angry about choices that people we know and love are making. Or we're angry maybe about things that are going on in our community, and so I have to remind myself what James said in James 1.20, that man's anger does not bring about the righteous life that God requires. So people are not going to turn to Jesus because I'm angry. And I'm not saying that we should leave the hard truths out of our conversations. We should be courageous about what we believe and why we believe it. You know, for example... When you tell someone that Jesus said he is the only way of salvation, they might be offended. I was talking to a teacher at an elementary school when we were pastoring in the Philadelphia area. We were uh, partnering with an elementary school, and uh, we were out on the playground playing games with the kids, and uh, this teacher came to talk to me, and she said, don't you think that there are many ways to God? And I said, well, it doesn't really matter what I think. What matters is what Jesus said. And Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And she wasn't happy with that answer. But I didn't say it in an angry way or a derogatory way. I just very kindly said to her, here's what Jesus said. Now, you know, sometimes in the day we're living in, this fear of offending people 
gets in the road of us being a good ambassador for Jesus? You know what I mean? So are you more fearful of offending than you are of a person going into eternity without Jesus? So tell the truth, because the Holy Spirit honors that. We should also remember that telling the truth also requires a work of God's Holy Spirit in drawing people to Jesus because that, that takes a miracle of God working in a person's heart, right? And so we want to pray that in this season, God will use us to be good ambassadors for Jesus. Be an example of godliness for unbelievers. Secondly, be prepared to suffer for Jesus. So listen to what Peter writes about this in 1 Peter 3, 14 to 17. But he says, but even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Now, how many of you know it doesn't necessarily feel that way if you're suffering for what is right, right? But that's what the Word of God says. If you suffer for what is right, you are blessed. And then he goes on to say, do not fear what they fear. Do not be frightened. But in your heart, set apart Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. It is better if it is God's will to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. Now, I know we're living in a day when there is a cultural bias against biblical truth. And we're living in a day where we're seeing the fulfillment of biblical prophecy. For the Bible tells us that in the last days, evil will be called good and good will be called evil. Also that people will celebrate those who do evil and that we will suffer when we stand for truth. 1 Peter 4.4 declares, They think it's strange that you do not plunge with them into the same flood of dissipation, immoral behavior, and wild living, and they heap abuse on you. Now, that can happen to any of us. That can happen in your workplace. That can happen in your family. That can happen in this community, right? I mean, you'd like to believe that everybody loves everybody, but you've probably discovered that that isn't necessarily true, right? And there are people that will heap abuse on you when you stand up for Jesus. But that shouldn't happen because you're angry and condemning. Do you hear me, church? It shouldn't happen because you're angry and condemning. We should never apologize for anything the Bible teaches, but we need to speak the truth in love. So let me just suggest to you, if you know that your evangelism skills are lacking, ask the Lord to help you grow as a good ambassador for Jesus in a world that is broken. And one of the ways you can do that is read some testimonies of people who have come to Jesus and how the Holy Spirit used somebody to witness to them. You'll find... Um, on the Gospel Coalition, on that particular website, you'll find a lot of stories of people who came to Christ. And, and you'll see how God used people to be witnesses to them. I love reading those stories. They inform me, and they also give me insight into how the Holy Spirit works in lives to draw people to Jesus. And I want to be working with the Holy Spirit and be involved in that process. How about you? Now, I know that in our culture today, one of the big lies is that followers of Jesus are unloving because we don't support the political and cultural agendas of our day. But listen, church, it would be unloving to not speak the truth and to let people around us be destroyed by lies. But remember, in speaking the truth, my goal is not to win an argument. In speaking the truth, my goal is that a lost person meets Jesus. 
because he's the only one who can change a person's heart. So it's not about me winning an argument and proving I am right. It's about them meeting Jesus. And I want them to see Jesus in me. Third thing I want to say to you about how to be an ambassador for Jesus in a broken world is be Holy Spirit sensitive. Say that with me. Be Holy Spirit sensitive. You know, I don't know what your personality is like. We all have different personalities, right? And, uh, and those personalities can be an asset or a liability depending on whether or not we're doing what we sang about earlier, whether we're surrendering them to Jesus, right? Uh, and what do I mean by that? Well, for, for some people, all an individual ever gets from you is, is thunder and lightning. You know what I mean? If, if, if that's your personality, that all a person ever gets from you is thunder and lightning, or if on the other hand, all a person ever gets from you is sunshine, you're, you're probably living out your personality rather than discerning what is it that this person needs to hear? And, and, and let me go a little further in explaining this. You know, the person who is thunder and lightning, they have one message. You're going to hell. You're going to hell. You're going to hell. And that's, and that's their message. And the person who is sunshine all the time is, well, you know what? It's okay. Everybody has to find their own pathway through life. And, you know, as long as you're sincere, God wants you to be happy, so it's all right. And, and they're just, you know, trying to smooth everything over instead of speaking what that person really needs to hear from the Lord. So Colossians 4, 5 says, be wise in the way you act toward outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. If we're wise, we'll ask the Holy Spirit to help us understand what's happening in the life of this person that I'm talking to. And one of the questions that I ask myself when I'm in situations that it helps me to be sensitive to what the Holy Spirit is doing, I ask, what has the Holy Spirit been doing in the life of this person before I showed up? What has the Holy Spirit been doing in the life of this person before I showed up? That question helps me to be aware that I'm not necessarily the only person God has been using in this individual's life. So how, God, do you want to use me in their life? Do you want to use me to plant or to water? Or am I going to partner with you in seeing them come into your kingdom? How do you want to use me? So let me share a story, an example of this. I was on a, a flight to Brussels, and then from there was going to Vilnius, Lithuania, uh, to do a marriage seminar for pastors and their spouses. And so I introduced myself to my seatmate when I got on the flight. Uh, going to call her Pamela, and she was on her way to Greece to meet up with her husband. So during the flight, I had my iPad out and I was studying my notes. Uh, for the marriage seminar that I was going to be conducting in Lithuania. And, and Pamela noticed what I was reading, and, and it would be pretty hard not to notice because in these years of my life, I used 24 font. You know what I mean? Can any of you relate to that? You know, the, the, the font started out at 12 many years ago, and then it went to 14, and then 16, and 18, and finally I just said, okay, we're going to 24 so probably people could read what I had in front of me a couple rows back. And so Pamela's alongside of me, and she's noticing what I'm doing, and she uh, asked, what are you going to be doing? And I told her what I was going to be doing, and she asked, what are you going to tell them? I thought, oh, that's an open door. She wants to know what I'm going to tell these pastors and spouses in Lithuania about marriage. She was very curious. So before I had left on this trip, when I was packing up different things that I wanted to take along, I had a copy of this little booklet, Since Nobody's Perfect, How Good is Good Enough? And I had a copy of that laying on my desk. It's written by Andy Stanley, and it just presents the gospel. Um, and helps us to understand that we need Jesus. And uh, so I just kind of felt a nudge in my heart. 
take that along with you. So I put it into my backpack, and I took it along with me. And while I'm sitting there having this conversation with Pamela, just that nudge of the Holy Spirit that she's the person that you're supposed to give this book to. That's why you took it along with you. It's for her. And, uh, and so at some point during the flight, uh, we were having a conversation again, and I had gotten this book out, and I handed it to her, and I said, I would like to give you this book if you're okay with accepting it. And so she took the book, and she looked at the title, and then she opened it and began to look at the chapter titles in it, and then she turned and she said to me, my aunt will be very glad to hear that you gave me this book. I promise to read it. And I thought, oh, the Holy Spirit's been up to something in this lady's life before I ever showed up with this book. And I said to her, tell me about your aunt. And I discovered that she had a godly aunt who had been praying for her for years. I was just another person that the Holy Spirit was using in her life. Just like you can be another person that the Holy Spirit uses in someone's life. And you don't know whether you're planting or watering or whether you're going to be involved in seeing them come into the kingdom. So I was another person. And so my part in the years since then is every time the Holy Spirit brings her name to my remembrance, I pray for her uh, because she promised she would read this book. And so that seed got sown into her heart. So be Holy Spirit sensitive. Fourthly, be culturally aware. 1 Peter 4, 1 to 5 says, So then, since Christ suffered physical pain, you must arm yourselves with the same attitude he had and be ready to suffer too. For if you have suffered physically for Christ, you have finished with sin. You won't spend the rest of your lives chasing your own desires, but you will be anxious to do the will of God. You've had enough in the past of the evil things that godless people enjoy, their immorality and lust, their feasting and drunkenness and wild parties, and their terrible worship of idols. Of course, your former friends are surprised when you no longer plunge into the flood of wild and destructive things they do, so they slander you. But remember that they will have to face God, who stands ready to judge everyone, both the living and the dead. Are you amazed at how rapidly our culture has changed in the last five years? Are you, are you amazed at that? Of how swiftly rational thinking has been rejected on so many issues in our culture. We've invented our own truth systems. Even when logic and known scientific facts prove those systems false. And, and we are living in this era of what some call, have called as a post-truth culture. So we need to be aware enough of the issues of our day and what God's Word has to say about those issues so that we can introduce Jesus into our cultural conversations or else we're just going to get all caught up with the arguments that are going on today and we'll get distracted from our mission. And of course, when we talk about Jesus there are those who are going to try to silence us by hanging labels on us, by calling us names. But you know what I've discovered? That even if they try to smear the church of Jesus Christ, we're producing evidence of God's love in how we serve, in how we love, in how we give. And, and just some examples of this. In light of all of the recent hateful rhetoric toward people who are pro-life, you should know what God's people do to serve women who are in need. There are over 3,000 pregnancy care centers throughout our country 
who served over 3 million women last year with services and material assistance with a value of over $270 million. You should know that. We are serving and loving and giving. The church is doing that throughout our nation. When I think of the increase of mass murders in our nation and the angry, often fatherless young men who commit these crimes, I'm thankful for church ministries that love and mentor hurting children. So I thank God that you have a Royal Ranger ministry here. I see some of the pictures on your Facebook page and, and the girls' ministry. I'm not sure if you call that impact. Or, and, and you have other ministries, you know, to children. And that is so important. That is even so more important in our culture today than what it has ever been. Do you know that since 1960, fatherless boys in our nation have almost doubled from 17% to 34%? Those boys and the girls also, they need the church of Jesus Christ. They need what you have to offer, Kinport Assembly of God. So what you're investing in with your time and your treasure and your energy, that is not in vain. The gospel of Jesus Christ and the church of Jesus Christ are the only hope for addressing these issues. So our culture needs a loving and healthy church now more than ever. So be culturally aware, not so that you can win an argument, but so you can speak God's answers to the needs of our day. Ed Stetzer said this, the moment we are in does not pause the mission we are on. You may not like the moment in time and the moment in history we're living in, but that doesn't pause the mission. We are people on mission with Jesus. And the last thing I want to talk to you about this morning is to be against false teaching. In 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 1, Peter says, but there are also false prophets among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you. They will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the sovereign Lord who bought them, bringing swift destruction on themselves. And you should go home and read that entire chapter of 2 Peter 2. It's very, it's very sobering. In our day, there are those who are introducing what is being called progressive progressive Christianity in an attempt to befriend our culture and to be supportive of the woke issues of our day. And in speaking against such conformity, I am not saying that we should not listen to honest questions that people have or, or honest doubts or honest fears. However, what is being introduced today that's being called the deconstruction of our faith is not about honest questions. It's about encouraging you to become the one who decides what is true in the Bible and what is not true in the Bible. And that results in denying the authority of God and His Word, and it promotes me, self, to come up with my own personal religion based on what I like and what I don't like. But how many know that truth is still the truth? Just because a person may choose not to believe it doesn't mean that it's no longer the truth. You see, this is a conflict between God and His creation. We're either God's creation, we're either God's creation created in His image and likeness, or we are self creators who can determine what we will be and become and what is true and not true for us. So the Bible teaches that we should be people who surrender to God's design because we owe obedience and gratitude to the Creator. And it is only by doing so that we can find the true meaning of our lives, our true identity, and find what our hearts really long for. Because that can only be found in Jesus. 
Your heart's not going to be satisfied with some truth invention of your own, which isn't true at all. Let me share one final story with you to encourage you that the gospel of Jesus Christ is still the power of God unto salvation. It does not need to be changed. It does not need to be updated to fit our culture. There is not a more progressive version of the gospel that is better. For a number of years, when we pastored in the Philadelphia area, my wife worked for an attorney doing the work of legal aid, and she job shared this work with another lady whose husband was a big city attorney in Philly. And she called me one day, my wife called me one day to tell me that this man was in the hospital and had just been told that he had terminal lung cancer and did not have long to live. And the lady she job shared with, the wife of this man, wondered if I would go and visit her husband in the hospital. So on the way to the hospital to meet, I'm going to call him Joe, on the way to the hospital to meet Joe, who I did not know, I was praying. And the Holy Spirit impressed Romans 10, 9 to 11, and 13 on my heart. So when I walked into the hospital room, I introduced myself to Joe. We made the connection. Our wives worked together. And, uh, and then I said to him, I said, Joe, I, I hear you received some bad news today. Would you like to talk about it? And he talked. And I listened. When he was finished talking, I asked him, may I read some scripture to you? And he said, yes. And so I read, if you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. As Scripture says, anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame. And in verse 13, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So I asked him, Joe, would you like to do that? And he said, I think it's too late for me. And I told him, Joe, it's not too late for Jesus to hear your prayer. And he said, well, the only prayer that I know is the Our Father. So I suggested that we pray the Our Father out loud together. And when we finished praying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, when we finished praying that prayer, that he could just continue then in his own words. And we did. And he did. And Joe kept on praying and confessing his sins to Jesus and received salvation. On my next visit to the hospital, my wife was with me. His wife came out of the hospital room when she saw us coming. And she said, my husband is a changed man, and I want to know what did you do to him? And I said, I didn't do anything to him, but Jesus did. Joe went to heaven not too long after that. At the funeral luncheon, they told a whole lot of lawyer stories about him. But the final story was the Jesus story. He had a new eternal destination, church, because Jesus still saves. Jesus still saves. We have heard the joyful sound, Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Spread the tidings all around, Jesus saves, Jesus saves. He still does. But church, 
there will be zero motivation and conviction to share the gospel if you don't really believe that people need to hear it in order to be saved. There is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Amen? So let's just review. Number one, be an example of godliness for unbelievers. Number two, be prepared to suffer for Jesus. Number three, be Holy Spirit sensitive. Number four, be culturally aware. And number five, be against false teaching. So we're going to stand this morning, church, and we're going to prepare ourselves to share from the Lord's table.